And on this episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast, we talk to the busiest guitarist in the world, Steve Brown from Trickster. We talk about all his various projects and how he turned his dream into a rock and roll reality. Check it out. Well, Steve, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How are you tonight, brother? Doing fantastic, Mike. Greetings from sunny Canton, Ohio. <laughs> awesome. So right now, you're out on tour with the Wizards of Winter. How's that going? Tour's been going great. We've been out for about a month now. We started out in Florida. It was pretty ironic being out on a a Wizards of Winter Christmas tour and starting your tour in Key West, Florida. But (laughs) we are, uh, we're we're winding down here. We got another five shows left. And, uh, you know, being that this is my first year with the Wizards of Winter, all all I can say is I'm having a fabulous time out here. And the shows have been going great. A lot of sellout shows around the country. And, uh, just uh, really enjoying this. Tell us a little bit about the uh, Christmas Dream album. Well, the you know, this Wizards of Winter, this is the band's 10-year anniversary. It's my debut tour with the Wizards of Winter. So, you know, the backstory is that this band was started uh, 10 years ago by Scott and Sharon Kelly. Uh, Scott is the keyboard player, master wizard of the band, and his wife Sharon, who sings lead vocals and plays flute. And, uh, and Fred Gorhow, who's my uh, co-guitar player, who's the lead guitar player in Wizards of Winter, who wrote all the, all the riffs and all and arranged all the music with Scott. And so they've come up with a tremendous record. I did not play on, on any of the records and, uh, and the Christmas Dream, so I'm just doing the tour. But, you know, my, my good buddy Fred played some incredible guitar work on the record. And, um, And the story is, you know, the Christmas dream is a story of all the different sides that come with Christmas. And, you know, we all kind of associate the holidays and Christmas time with good times and fun and family and and, and, and religion and whatnot and, you know, and faith. But there's also, as we know in real life, there's a lot of different sides where there are, you know, a lot of people who don't get to have those, you know, magic Christmas moments or whatnot. So that, that's, that's kind of the story of the Christmas dream. And we have a narrator out in our live show, Tony Gaynor, who is with Trans Siberian Orchestra for 15 years. So he narrates the story as we play the songs, and it really kind of pulls everything together. So you have kind of a rock opera type thing with the Wizards of Winter show. That's nice because for me, a lot of times um, I get kind of get called a Scrooge by my family because I like Christmas, but I don't always like all the Christmas music that's out because, hey, I'm a metalhead. Yeah. I like hard rock. I like heavy metal. So I'm glad to hear the music that's on the Wizards of Winter. You guys do a lot of cool dual leads. Um, there's one song that really stuck out to me. It was called Gonna Snow, and it has almost like yep. an 80, yeah, 80s rock intro, and then it busts into Jingle oh, Bells. Oh, yeah, yeah, total. That's a Van I-, I told the guys as soon as I said, oh, I'm going to love playing that one because it's got a Van Halen, like Jamie's crying vibe to it. Um, it's totally, and we read that one's incredible, and our, our vocalist, Alex- Alexis Smith, she sings that one in the live show, and Fred and I really do a total 80s hard rock Van Halen rat type style thing to that one. So that's a, uh, that's a live, that's definitely a live favorite. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So along with this, man, when I look through all the different things that you do, you're a pretty busy guy, right? <laughs> I am, my brother, and I am certainly blessed. Uh, the phone never stops ringing, so... Uh, with that, I am very, very thankful. You know, I'm, I'm coming into my 2020 is going to be my 30th year as a national act artist, you know, touring with Trickster and every other band in between, you know, Trickster, Def Leppard, Danger Danger, uh, Wizards of Winter, Eric Martin Band, Dennis D. Young of Sticks. So it's, uh, I'm a very, very busy guy. My 80s band, Rubik's Cube. So, um, you know, I tell people this, and I, and I say this all the time when I do interviews, I am truly one of the luckiest guys in the world. I've been blessed to be able to live my dreams a hundred times over. Well, let's touch on some of these things you just mentioned. Let's start with Death Leopard. Uh, that had to be a pretty surreal situation filling in for those guys, right? Yeah, I mean, that's one of those things. I mean, you know, the, 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 the way the Death Leopard thing you know, came about, which I'm sure you've probably heard, is, you know, those guys have been friends of mine 
you know, since nine, I met them in 1987, you know, 88 on the Hysteria tour, you know, and Phil Collin and I, Phil has been like a big brother, a uh, godfather to me, you know, always trying to help me with my different projects, different bands after Trickster. And, um, and we, you know, we've been friends for, you know, well over 30 years, you know, like Joe Elliott said, we've known you, we've, we've known you longer than we've known Vivian, you know, which is, you know, there's not many people out there that are still Still, you know, uh, that are still friends, you know, bad friends and with bands that kind of comes and goes. But with those guys, you know, it was always um, kind of like they were like part of my family because I've known them so long and especially that I knew them so well when Steve Clark was in the band. You know, I remember, you know, when when their manager, Peter Mensch, called and told us, told me that, you know, Steve Clark had died. You know, so we were through a lot of it together. I was there with Phil when he found out he was having his first son, you know, when his son Rory was born. You know, I was on the phone with him. Steve, I'm going to be a dad, you know. <laughs> so it's like that. But, you know, when, when Vivian was diagnosed with cancer, you know, Phil stepped up and he immediately, he immediately knew and told the guy, Steve is going to do this. He's got the voice. He can do, you know, he can do all the parts. And, and sure enough, and it was one of those things where, you know, people say to me all the time, did you ever imagine, did you ever think that you'd be, uh, you know, in Def Leppard? And, you know, as a little kid holding up the Pyromania record or holding up Hysteria, you know, and even going back to On Through the Night, which is, uh, you know, I've been a Def Leppard fan since day one. Um, to think that, you know, I play with them and, you know, I've done 15, 16 shows with them. You know, it's not like I didn't think it would happen. It's surreal when it does. But, you know, man, I've worked all my life to be in that position. But, you know, more than anything, just honored and humbled to be, you know, chosen by them and chosen year in and year out. And especially last year when Phil had his issue, you know, there's nobody that I know of in the music business that's ever done what I've done, you know, in the sense of filling in for both different guitar players in a major, you know, Hall of Fame rock band, you know. So, but the coolest thing last year when Phil had his issue and he had, um, you know, had to take care of his family and, and leave the tour was he told everybody before he, right before he left, he said, there's no one on earth who could do this but Steve. And that was, a, you know, that was, that was a very, very complimentary thing for him to say to everybody you know in the band and and the management and everything and just let everybody know that's going to be covered and sure enough it was and you know it just it's it's a it's a it's a testament to our friendship and the trust that we have in each other and he knows that i'm always there for him and uh, they know i'm always there for you know i'm always there for them and they're there for me you know they've taken very good care of me over the years and you know even the years when i didn't play i was paid by them and you know so just it's they're they're one of the greatest people greatest bands and i've been around a lot of bands they're one of the greatest bands just as people to be around and their organization everybody that they have working for them so you know i'm i'm blessed to have uh, to have them in my in my life steve how much time did you have to prepare to learn all the songs for death leopard well, the first time when I filled in for Vivian, that was a very, in 2013 is when, you know, Vivian got diagnosed and then they brought me in right away. So they gave me a hard drive with all the songs. So I was able to really study everything. And, you know, I, I had six months before I ever did anything with them. And I went to Europe and was kind of hanging around just in case there was some issue. And then 2014, so I had a lot of time. And, you know, the real the real good thing with Def Leppard is they're one of my favorite bands, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, you know, between Kiss, Van Halen, and Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, and, you know, Cheap Trick, you know, they're one of certainly my top five favorite bands ever. So it helps when you get a call to fill in for a band that you're such a fan of. So I knew all those songs in my head without ever even playing a lot of them, you know, so it was very easy for me to learn, but at the same time, some of the stuff, and this is what I always say about Death Leopard, people listen to it, and because it's produced so well, I mean, Mutt Lang is the greatest rock producer ever, so his records, they always sound so smooth and perfect and so sweet and so easy on the ears, but some of the Death Leopard guitar parts that 
Steve Clark Road or Phil Road or Pete Willis and even Sav Savage. You know, Sav writes a lot of, you know, he wrote the guitar part for God's of War, you know, and the, you know, the, the arpeggio stuff. And I think he wrote the part, the part for Foolin'. Some of that stuff is tricky, man. You know, and, and it was a lot, some of the Def Leppard material is harder than I thought it was. And, uh, you know, um, it's it's no joke, and and you know, it's just again, it goes back to why Def Leppard is still to this day selling out arenas and stadiums all around the world because they are that much better and just a cut above the rest. Nice, nice. So you got a new album coming out in 2020 with Tokyo Motor Fist. That's got Ted Poley from Danger Danger uh, on vocals. Can you tell us a little bit about that album? Yeah, well, we're just, you know, we're on our sophomore record. You know, the, our, our friends at Frontiers came up with this concept of, you know, they've been doing these super groups for a while now, and they offered it to me and Ted. So I brought in my good friend Greg Smith on bass guitar, who you know is with Ted Nugent, Alice Cooper, Rainbow. And, and Greg is out on bass on the Wizards of Winter, so he's out with me now. And we're actually recording bass parts out on the road. You know, which is really incredible. So we're, we're having a blast out here. And then on drums in Tokyo Motor Fist is the legend Chuck Berge, who is Billy Joel's drummer. And he's, he also played drums on the first half of the first Bon Jovi record. He was in Rainbow for a while. He was in Hall and Oates. So it truly is a super group. And we're all, the great thing about it is we're all, you know, kind of cut from the same mold. We all grew up basically in the same area. You know, three of us are from New Jersey and Greg Smith's from Long Island. So, our sense of humor is kind of the same, which is good. And, you know, we just love being in this project. And we're, um, you know, our first record was a worldwide success. You know, people hailed it as, you know, al album of the year and melodic rock record of the year. And we got to do some great gigs. And so here we are. We're about, you know, three quarters of the way done with the new record. And I, I got to tell you, man, we've topped ourselves again. You know, I think this is probably my best recorded work to date and a uh, very cool thing last week i was by dennis d young from sticks who's a good friend of mine and i also play in his band every once in a while he was gracious enough to play a keyboard solo on one of the songs we have a song called lions on the new tokyo motor fist record and he played a a, a classic dennis d young 70s style you know grand keyboard solo so we're very excited for that Man, you got friends in high places here, huh? Yeah, man. I'm being, you know, I'm blessed in that sense. You know, I mean, listen, I've been, again, I say it all the time, and it's true, man. I've been blessed a hundred times over in this business. You know, listen, back in the day, you know, you know how they always say that thing, you know, be, be sometimes meeting your idols or meeting your famous people isn't all it's cracked up to be. Luckily for me, I've had nothing but great experiences, you know, going back to, you know, I'm, I, I have a, you know, a 30 year friendship with Eddie Van Halen and, he was, you know, he, of course, he was my biggest influence and my hero as a kid and still a great friend. And, um, when the first time I ever met him, he was the nicest guy in the world to me. And I'll never forget that. And so I don't, I, I look at everybody as like equals, you know, and, and like when people come up and say, Oh my God, it's so nice to meet you. You know, I meet people every day at different shows all around the world and they you know they go to me oh my god i've waited all my life to meet you and i'm just like hey man i'm no different than anybody else i just play guitar and sing and write music this is my job you might work at you know fatheads brewery and you might work at a you know at a uh, auto mechanic shop but you're no different than i am we're all the same you know we're all just trying to get through life and you know and enjoy ourselves but you know certainly yeah i've been very very blessed in the sense of you know being able to go out on tour with Kiss, you know, hang out with Eddie Van Halen, um, you know, play in to play stadiums with Def Leppard, hang out with Bon Jovi, you know, grow up with these guys, you know. So it's a it's a really, you know, my life is kind of like a movie or a, or a, or a book, you know, in the sense I truly am, you know. I definitely know when I do finally do a, do an autobiography, I certainly will know that it's going to be titled One in a Million because my <laughs> my life sometimes seems like that. Well, that's a great segue into talking about the Killer Trickster debut. What are some of your favorite memories from making that album? Oh, man. All of them, really. You know, I mean, it's an incredible story. You know, for me, uh, I started Trickster in 1983 when I was 12 years old. And 
to, to have something that you start so young. And basically, I knew since I was probably 11 or 12 years old that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life and that this is what I want to do, and I'm going to do it no matter what. And, and I was able to achieve that. You know, I was able to assemble a group of guys who, you know, we certainly weren't, wasn't, we weren't the best band in the world. We were very raw. We were very rough because we were so young. We were inexperienced, but we had a fire and we had something unique. You know, the cool thing I can, you know, say about Trickster, you know, compared to the other 80s bands who I love, I was such, you know, I mean, that's the thing about Trickster. We were such fans of everything, and I think that showed in what we did. We weren't afraid to wear our influences on our sleeves, but the difference is, and I think that how we succeeded was because we were so different. You know, if you look at the Give It To Me Good video and you look at our picture, you know, our image and everything that we did was so different than, let's say, the L.A. bands. Yeah. You know, while they're sh- while they're showing pictures of them, you know, riding in limos with strippers, with hot tubs, and blah blah blah. You know, videos like that. We had a video of us hanging out at the diner, riding dirt bikes, wearing jeans and flannel shirts and rock t-shirts. It was very different, and it certainly resonate resonated with the fans. You know, and we basically, as you know. You know, we owned the MTV for the better part of six months at the end, you know, in 1990 with the last part of last quarter, 1990 and 91. I mean, we had like 23 consecutive weeks at number one. So my favorite memories of it all, I mean, the whole time was just magical, you know, from getting, you know, getting a major label record deal at 18 years old, going out to Hollywood, California to live and record our first album, working at, you know, the classic, you know, Sound City recording studios, the Village recording studios, all these studios that I remember reading in the credits of Dio Records and Rat Records and Van Halen, everything, meeting David Lee Ross on our first time out in LA I mean it was it was crazy hanging out with Slash and Rick Rubin and you know all these you know LA rockers for the first time I mean you know as an 18 19 year old kid it was very very impressionable and and we loved it that's for sure you know we never you know I told the story to somebody the other day you know I remember when we made our first record out in LA you know we went out there we went to a couple like parties and industry things and we would we were always so personable at least I was and TJ I guess you know we would always go over and talk to other bands like oh there's so and so let's go over and say hi and I just remember a couple times man we we didn't get we didn't get like uh, a warm welcome if you will it was kind of like you know people bands would look at us because I think the LA bands there was so much competition that they just anybody had a record deal and you know they looked at as competition where the east coast bands like uh, Skid Row, Bon Jovi, I mean, those guys took us under their wings, you know, John and Richie and Snake and Rachel and Scotty from Skid Row, those guys took us under their wings and helped us, you know, where the L.A. bands, I don't think any of those L.A. bands helped each other, I think they all just fucking, you know, it was kind of like every every band for himself, like every man for himself, so it was a different scene, but, you know, that was it, and you know, I mean, one of the, you know, we'll end it on one of the greatest memories I have is, you know, when we put out our record and then, you know, six months later, you know, the, the build of the record to where we put out the single line of fire and all of a sudden it, it, it went, you know, started going up the charts. And then it was like learning about how you break a band and the business aspect, because I was always so intrigued and into, I learned very early on from John Bon Jovi how important the business aspect was. So I wanted to learn how, how you get a hit. And I learned how you get a hit song where it's got to be, it's got to be added to all these radio stations around the country, the little stations, and then the bigger medium station. And then finally, once it gets added to the big stations, that's when, once you know you have a hit, that's when MTV is finally going to add your video. And sure enough, we made the Give It To Me Good video in May, right when our first record came out of 1990. And then it took four months for MTV to add our video 
to the playlist. And as soon as they did, it got added. And then the next day, we were like number nine on Dial MTV. And then I think it was like a day or two later, we were number one. And Give It To Me Good was number one for 13 straight weeks. And, you know, I say it all the time. Our lives changed, though, you know, in those things. Because I remember we were out on tour with Striper. And it was like all of a sudden, our shows were like, it was like we were the headliner. You know, and Michael Sweet and the Striper guys are still great friends. And we laugh about that now, you know, how we were opening for them. But it was really... Really, like at one point when we were number one, it was like we were headlining the shows because we were selling more T-shirts and tickets than they were, you know. And then so it's just that, and that's the way it goes, you know. But it was just a magical, magical time, man. And we were so young and naive, and you know, like little kids in a candy store, if you will. So we were trying everything, girls everywhere, you know, partying, drinking, having. We were just having the fucking time of our lives. You know, and it was something that I will never, ever forget. And, you know, it's, it's, it's why I'm here today, you know. Yep. You know, for being younger guys when that came out and that's your debut, I mean, those songs stand up, man. You got some really well-written songs on that album, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was always the thing, you know, and that was where, you know, sadly, you know, and it wasn't my fault, but, you know, sonically, the record never measured up for me because there were too many cooks in the kitchen, right. if you will, you know. When you're signed to a major record label, you have a lot of people to answer to. And, you know, you have managers and lawyers and agents and A&R guys. And there are a lot of people, and especially I was so young, I knew what I wanted. And I was very much involved, you know, Bill and Jim Ray, who produced the first Trix record. You know, every decision fell on me, which was like, you know, they would always go, man, Steve, are you cool with this? And, you know, that's pretty heavy when you're an 18-year-old kid to have those decisions. Decisions and you know I kind of knew in my heart what was right, but sadly the way the mix came out and stuff was not what I had envisioned. But it worked because you know as I got older I understood it more, and it was like it was more believable. I wanted us to sound like Def Leppard, but our record company wanted us to be more garage sounding because they said it'll be more believable if you guys sound like you're in the garage like you're rehearsing at my parents house like we did and they were right to some degree you know and i and and you know i i wanted more of a polish sound and you can hear that when we did the one in a million video I had the record company, we went in and remixed One in a Million, and I had Mike Shipley, who was Def Leppard's engineer and mix, Mutt Lang's mix engineer, he mixed the single. So if you listen to the, the YouTube video, One in a Million, and see that, the difference of the record version and the album version, you know, that, that's where I wanted to go. And that's when I took over the reins producing after the first record to where when we did the second record, I was co-producer with Jim Barton from Queensryche and, and Rush fame. And if you listen to the second record here, you can hear the huge leap of sonically where we went. It was kind of, you know, here was definitely more in the realm of, you know, of the Van Halen, you know, uh, Van Halen, Bon Jovi, Def Leppard sound. That's more where I wanted us to go. And, you know, so... But listen, at the end of the day, listen, I, I'm, I couldn't be happier with the way things turned out. So let's talk about the second album here in 1992. So great album, but the climate in music had changed. What was the expectation at that point with all the changes? Oh, shit. Well, the expectation was, you know, take over the world. You know, we had, we were, you know, what happens when you're in a band for all the listeners that don't, don't know? You're out on tour and when you're out on the road and you're, you're, you live in a bubble, um, that people, you're sheltered from the real world. And I got to be honest with you, man, we were on tour and we were selling out. We were on, you know, tour with the Scorpions. We did six months with the Scorpions, sold out arenas all around the country. Then we went out on the road in 1991 with Warrant and Firehouse. We had the huge tour that we did. That was a top 10 pole star. Uh, you know, gen top 10 tour of the year. No one thought it would be as big as it was. So coming into 1991, we went, we were in LA finishing up the tour. And I remember vividly our old radio guy, this guy, Bill Bennett, who God bless him, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a huge, you know, radio guy in the seventies, eighties. 
and he was instrumental in breaking Trickster, and he had gotten hired to be the president, or he was the head of radio at uh, Geffen Records, and we went over to his office to congratulate him. I think we gave him a gold record or something, and uh, he goes, guys, I want you to listen to something, and I remember like yesterday, man, he sat us down, he goes, there's this new band out of Seattle, they're called Nirvana, and they're blowing up at radio, what do you think? And he played us, Smells Like Teen Spirit. And I was like, I was like, wow, man, it's like, it sounds like Black Sabbath meets Cheap Trick. And he, he laughed and he said, yeah, they're doing pretty cool. We'll see what happens. And, you know, lo and behold, that moment was kind of where our, our genre, the whole 80s hard rock thing, was killed. You know, and we all know what happened in 1992. So, you know, we had just renegotiated our deal with MCA Records at the end of uh, beginning of 1992. We got a million dollar deal. You know, I was there with my manager and my lawyer and renegotiated with the president of MCA Records. It was really, really cool thing because no, I don't know any guys in other bands that were able to sit in the, uh, sit in the uh, negotiating room with, with, you know, with the record company heads and negotiate a deal but they wanted me there and we did it and we got a million bucks we got a half a million dollar advance which was great could put some money in our in our bank a house and uh and then we got a half a million dollars to make a record and the expectation they heard some of the demos that we did of road of a thousand dreams and power of love and runaway train and they were like man the mca people were like dude this record this record is a hard rock record but it's deeper you know and if you listen to some of the songs on here you can hear that there was some socially i had really i really wanted to show that trickster wasn't a fucking kid hard pop we weren't the new kids on the block we could be like a bon jovi we could be a def leppard we could be that and i think we did it with the record it was just the timing of it but mca was like oh my god man we want to do this and that you know they put a lot of money into it but sadly when it came out you know we had gotten the kiss tour and I knew it was over when two weeks into when the record, two weeks after the record was released, we got the word that MTV was not going to add our video to the rotation. And that's when we all kind of looked at each other and said, holy shit, man, this is it. You know, this is going to be a, this is going to be a long tour. And it was, we were, we were lucky enough to go out on the road for the next 10 months and survive you know we did three months with kiss at the end of 1992 and then we did seven months of touring on our own you know doing festivals and fairs and stuff and um uh, but that was pretty much it man so from that that point on it was you know just trying to survive and then we did the undercovers record you know which was just a way to get us you know for, I, I built a recording studio in my house so we recorded the undercovers record as a way to learn how to use the studio and i i learned how to become an engineer so you know look man it is what it is but it just didn't work out all you know as as we had hoped it didn't work out but certainly we got more than we ever dreamed nice well hey we got to talk about kiss that's my favorite band what was it like on yeah. the revenge tour talk about kiss Kiss was fun, you know, it was amazing, you know, to be out with those guys, and we had known Gene, we had known Gene before that, so he was great, and Paul, you know, I mean, look, all the fans know the Revenge Tour, if you ask any of the fans, that was a lot of the fans' favorite non-makeup era tours, you know, I think, I think personally for me, Hot in the Shade and Revenge were their best non-makeup records For sure. you know and those tours were phenomenal we you know it was a dream come true man i remember you know coming out on the first night and we're in the dressing room and gene comes in to welcome us to the tour he's eating he's got a, he's eating cookies and he's got a cup of coffee and you know being gene simmons and it was it was incredible man they treated us great you know we all know that it wasn't the most successful tour but that's because grunge had taken over you know so it was, uh, but needless to say, for when I was a little kid, Kiss was the first concert I saw in 1979, you know, to see, you know, on the Dynasty Tour. So to, to be able to go out on tour with them and, you know, say, again, it's like another dream come true. And it was just, uh, it was incredible. And, you know, those guys are still, to this day, we're still good friends with them. I, I went over the summer, took my family to see them when they played in New Jersey, you know, Eric Singer and Tommy Thayer are like brothers to me, and Gene and Paul are my, 
you know, my kiss uncles, you know, those guys <laughs> are great and we love them. And, you know, still to this day, they treat us great. Doc McGee, who's been a friend for 30 years now, you know, managing kiss. He's unbelievable. Took such good care of me and my family. So, you know, again, man, it's one of these, like, you got to pinch yourself sometimes. You know, for me, I'm very, very blessed, again, to be able to do all these great things that I get to do. I think I read something that you posted on Twitter. You were around when they were doing a Live 3, right? Weren't you checking out some of this as it was happening? Oh, well, we, that was on, fuck yeah, that was on the same tour. And I was there for every moment when they were making that record, along with recording some of the songs on a Live 3 that they never played live on that tour. What? So that's no... Uh, you know, no real surprise to anybody. But uh yeah, that was that was incredible. You know, I remember I remember being in the mobile truck with Eddie Kramer when they were recording and just sitting next to Eddie and going going to myself, This is pretty fucking awesome. I'm sitting in the remote truck with the legendary Eddie Kramer, engineer for Jimi Hendrix and Zeppelin, Kiss, you know, fucking while they're recording Kiss Alive Three. I was like, This is pretty fucking cool and it was. <laughs> Dude, man, you've done some cool shit. You got a favorite uh, Kiss album? Um, do I have a favorite Kiss album? I mean, that's really hard. I mean, I'm going to go, for me, I'm going to go with Rock and Roll Over because that was the first album, first Kiss album I ever had. And that, that was the record that basically changed my life and made me want to play guitar. You know, it was funny because, again, it was the, I got, I heard that record in 1978. Um, I borrowed it from my sister-in-law's brother and I just, I saw the cover and I'm like, can I borrow this? I don't know what it sounds like, but I want to hear it. And I remember put dropping the needle, the beginning of I want you coming on with the acoustic guitars. I'm like, oh, this sounds neat. And then when those drums and those guitars and Paul's voice kicked in, I was like completely blown away, mind blown. And, um, and then what happened a week later, one of my friend's brothers, goes you know he had known that we you know me and my friend both listened to kiss and discovered kiss and he was like you got to hear something else and he played me van halen for the first time running with the devil into eruption and i couldn't even i couldn't even believe when i heard eruption that that was an electric guitar you know especially the ending the tapping section and right after that i remember going home and telling my mother i want to take guitar lessons and it was within like couple weeks from getting you know hearing rock and roll over by kiss and van halen one that i was playing guitar and basically you know that year set my life into motion to what i'm doing now you know 41 years later i mean i'm going to be 50 in july so almost 42 years later those 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 two moments basically you know charted my future amazing stuff steve anything you want to finish off and say to the fans no, man, I'm Jay. Thanks for having me on. And, you know, to all the listeners out there, keep buying all of our, you know, all the bands out there on Frontiers Records and whatever label, all the hard rock bands. But keep buying the music, helping us out. Buy t shirts and buy the tickets. And thanks for all the years of support. We love you. And I'm, uh, I'm planning on 2020 being a banner, banner year for me and all the bands that I work with. And success to all my friends out there. All right. Well, keep rocking, Steve. Thanks for the talk tonight, brother. You bet, Mike. Thanks so much. Rock and roll, baby. Wow, those were some great stories from Steve. As you know, the holidays are approaching quickly, and the local food banks need your help. Reach out to them and see what kind of items they need. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays.